So I got my hands on Dragon's Dogma 2 a little bit early and I wanted to pop out a quick impressions, more casual video to let you all know my initial thoughts on this unique open world RPG. And we're gonna start right off with the elephant in the room and that is performance, chapter markers below. Do note that the footage that you're seeing in this video is early game content, mostly just me running around low level in the open world in the earlier areas of the human nation. Also note that I'm recording in 1440p, which does hurt the performance of my game as I play and record. So I have played on both my gaming laptop and my more beastly PC, and I play with both mouse and keyboard and controller. On my gaming laptop, I have a 3070 GPU with a Ryzen 7 5800, 3.2 gigahertz processor, and 16 gigabytes of RAM. And I played basically on 1080p, and I have my settings on both high and low. But to be honest with you, I wasn't noticing a huge difference between switching things around, so I ended up just running the game on medium to high settings. For the real movie cinematic cutscenes in the game, I was getting 150, 160 plus FPS. It was fantastic. For the more gameplay dialogue cutscenes where you're down in the body of your character, I was pulling around 60 to 65 FPS and then wandering around the open world, I was getting anywhere from 40 to 65 FPS with an average of, I would say, 45 when in the town areas. There were a few dips into the 30s, though. I do want to mention that. As someone who's not used to lower FPS as of the last several years, it was a bit jarring. But honestly, I would absolutely keep playing even if I didn't have a better PC to go home to. This does make me worry a bit, though, for those of you who have less powerful systems than my not-too-amazing laptop. Now, my real work gaming PC, I have a 4080 GPU, Ryzen 9 7900X 12-core processor, and 64 gigabytes of RAM, so pretty damn good. Not the best PC out there, but definitely a higher-end PC. I played mostly on 1440p resolution with medium to high graphical settings. I was getting about 60 to 80 FPS in the town areas, but in the busier type areas... I definitely felt it tank lower than that, and it, it was a little bit skippy at times. Out in the open world at nighttime, I was pulling around 100 to 135 FPS, which was great on 1440p. And in the daytime, under the beautiful sun, I would say I was averaging 70 to 100 FPS. So even with my great PC, it was pretty unsteady, but overall still playable for me. But like I said, I do worry about others. I have a pretty good PC. I do want to say that movement felt a little bit floaty in this game, I think is the word that I want to use, but I think this is more so because of the performance. When you're scanning the world and the environments, the game feels like it needs some time to process everything. Overall, the game is responsive when you click buttons and things like that, but it's just not as crisp feeling as many other games. So be sure to watch some other reviews on this subject matter. Overall, I'm going to be fine playing this on my good PC. A gaming laptop was not the greatest ever, but still playable because of other redeeming qualities that the game has. I only experienced a few minor bugs, but I've also haven't really experienced a ton of the game. I've just been hanging out in the earlier areas, exploring everything. My mouse was messing up my controller a little bit at random times, but that might be something on my end. And when you start the game, it does tell you that controller is recommended. And after playing with mouse and keyboard, I can understand why they're saying this. If all I had was mouse and keyboard, I would still play the game, but I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you that my controller experience was just simply better. The main problem with mouse and keyboard was getting your character to face the correct direction using WASD. In this game, Capcom doesn't play around, and let's say that you're playing as a fighter, you can't hold down block and hold your shield up and expect to block everything that comes at you. You have to be facing the opponent that is attacking you, and this does require some precision or even when you're attacking yourself with a weapon this game requires that you're somewhat deliberate with your aim with mouse and keyboard this means that you have to practice your wasd keys your mouse doesn't determine your aim so i had to keep telling myself to be much more deliberate when i press was and d focus on it much more make sure that i'm pressing it with real directional intent and once i started practicing this i did get better but it's definitely frustrating in the beginning and controller is simply easier and more convenient in this regards. Also, the default keybinds for a mouse and keyboard are quite awkward. You have to reach your fingers in weird ways holding down certain buttons, but the good thing here is that you can customize all of your keybinds. Surprisingly, this also goes for controller as well, which is pretty awesome. All right, so performance out of the way, what are my overall thoughts of the actual game? Well, this game is pretty damn Awesome. It's quite literally everything that I love in an open world action RPG. It's narrative driven, but not to a point where gameplay feels secondary. Gameplay is king 
in this game, but the narrative, at least in the first chunk of the game that I've experienced is really good. You can small talk to basically every NPC in the game, including your pawns, and there's really no long drawn out dialogue. Most of it's right to the point. I would say for narrative RPG lovers, this game will scratch your itch in terms of story content available, while also appealing to players who tend to not care as much about the dialogue in games. It's a nice, happy medium, I think I would say. Some NPCs are kind of stupid though, as you can steal right in front of them, or you just go into a shop and instead of buying things, you loot the chest in the corner. That's a bit weird, uh, but it was kind of like that in DD1 too. They could improve on this, but not a huge deal. Speaking of DD1, DD1 players will also feel right at home in this game. And actually there's a few clever Easter eggs for those of you guys who played the original. I'm really enjoying the setup for the story. It feels different from DD1, but it's also very similar. Although it may be a bit cliche, it's much easier, I think, to to understand than DD1, which was one of the downfalls of DD1, is a lot of people finished the game and had no idea what was even going on. Uh, but DD2 seems a little bit better in that regards. And also the movie-like cutscenes that you know that reinforce the story are really, really good and immersive. And also the characters that you meet, they're just they're they're, they're pretty cool. I do find myself just as excited to continue the main story and all the side stories and quests as I am to go out and kill monsters and farm materials. Now be prepared for the dialogue scenes as the mouth and lip animations are not the greatest in this game. Definitely getting some old school Oblivion vibes, just like DD1. The characters actually seem like they might be animated for the Japanese language, but with that said, the English voice acting is pretty good in this game. I have no problems with it whatsoever. You just have to be able to play and not stare at the mouths of characters too, too hard. For me, it didn't really subtract from the overall experience though. The open world in this game is beautiful. The game's menus and interfaces are very nice to look at, and the map is fantastic. I'm such a map lover of RPGs, and they really nailed it in this game. It's really immersive looking. It's non-artificial feeling. It's kind of similar to Elden Ring and Kingdom Come Deliverance. Now, sure, this game doesn't have the best graphics that you've ever seen, but a game's beauty doesn't always come down to graphical fidelity. And even with that said, I think this game actually does look pretty good. There's a few scenes in the beginning of the game that are really designed well to get you looking at the world beyond. It's just super motivating and exciting. Nighttime, of course, in this game is a much deadlier period of time. And like in DD1 and DD2, light is really important to see. But when you're just walking the open world at night, light in the far distance is really well visually represented. It'll almost be pitch black out, but you'll see a lantern or a fire or something similar off in the distance, and it really instills in the player a bit of wanderlust and mystery and excitement to just go out and see what things are. So from my experience so far, this is a fantastic open world design. So many little treasures around and secrets to discover, not to mention the game features some crafting where you need to pick up resources in the world, further incentivizing you to explore. I discovered this cave at night and I went in and got destroyed by these slimes, which you can see right here. Um, I didn't know how to defeat them. They basically swallowed me up, but it was so much fun to just be caught off guard in this scary cave that I walked into. Now keep in mind that this world is designed for immersion. So bright yellow items or pointing arrows or circles around bodies or NPCs do not exist. You have to stay engaged and look at your surroundings. Some things in this game do light up, but they light up very gently. Now there's plenty of cool items to look out for as you're out and about, even collectible items such as Seekers tokens, which there's said to be 240 total in this game. And that's gonna be a fun challenge for some of you that like to do stuff like that. Most of this game is also seamless, so the world really does feel real. Time is real within the world and it matters. And the world is alive, much more alive than in DD1. Another thing I wanna point out in regards to open world immersion is this game's music. I might be in recency bias mode right now, but the music is some of the best that I've heard in a while. Some really serene songs when you're out exploring, which are then contrasted by some amazing, more epic orchestral pieces when a battle begins or something intense is on the horizon. I'm really happy with the soundtrack so far, and it really does add a lot to the game. Speaking of contrast, the game's intro starts you off in a rather bleak setting, which is then contrasted by the beautiful open world when you get out there shortly after. Capcom did really good at creating this contrast, which keeps things fresh wherever you go. And honestly, I'm just so excited to make it to the other nation of Batal and also of course, the sacred arbor, which is home to the elves. As someone who greatly values exploration in games and immersion, this is top tier world design, I would say, not to mention it's a really big world. 
the intro to this game i would say is like 20 minutes long and i was smiling the entire time and then when you complete the intro you get this little cutscene that basically is the real start of the game i'm not going to spoil anything but i was cheesing so damn hard during this i felt like i was watching like lord of the rings for the first time again now, a common misconception leading up to DD2 is that DD2 will have no markers at all in this game. And while this is partially true, as characters will not have markers over their heads, at times there still will be markers on your map. Some quests will show up on your map. Some will have like little area blobs, others will have little marks, and other quests will not. It all depends on the quest, your level of knowledge, and your pawn's level of knowledge. That doesn't mean that there's not a lot of really you know, cryptic-like quests where you have to just really figure things out, but there's also a lot of quests that you can see on your map. So far, I think this is a really good level of forcing players to engage with a game. You can't play this game like you would play Skyrim, while also not completely leaving everything in the game unknown and open-ended. This game is definitely more hardcore in terms of quests though, as if you pick up a quest that sounds like it could be time sensitive, then it probably is. Capcom does not spoon feed you everything here. If you feel like something is in need of immediate attention, you should probably do that quest or you may fail that quest. It's part of the game and don't be too worried if you do fail. Like I said, in Baldur's Gate 3, you fail, it happens, you move on. In this game, it's the same way. It's designed for that. There are plenty of what we would say in modern times are more hardcore mechanics in this game, but this is something that I personally love. Nighttime is no joke, light is necessary, and you have oil that is required to light your lanterns. There's a ton of more nuanced mechanics to the pawns. Pulling out weapons will get NPC reactions. Reputations with vendors exist. Pricing of materials varies depending on vendors and also region. Different items such as consumables and food that you pick up go through different stages of deterioration or degradation. This system is actually quite nuanced because some consumables or combinable items will go through a few stages and you have to learn what stage offers the most benefits for either straight up consuming said item or combining it with other items. Resting in this game is of course important as your characters will suffer from the loss gauge over time if you don't rest meaning that your max hp will get lower and lower if you kill an npc they actually die and go to the morgue although you can resurrect them with limited wake stones many times there's consequences for hitting non-hostile npcs so be careful with where you swing your weapons encumbrance in this game of course affects speed and you have to manage your inventory in this regards running up hills consumes more stamina there's minimal fast travel your character size affect things like carrying capacity and stamina recovery and the list just goes on many of these are systems and mechanics that other developers try to avoid at all costs as they never want their players ever to feel frustrated but sometimes a little frustration in a game actually leads to higher highs when the player actually gets things things right and actually figures things out also having to be more engaged with a game's world and mechanics leads to higher levels of immersion i really appreciate capcom for this and i hope that dd2 baldur's gate 3 and even elden ring show more studios out there that us players actually enjoy playing and engaging with the games we don't necessarily always want everything to be kindergartner levels of understanding sometimes we like a real challenge now, one major mechanic that's going to take many players by surprise, especially you BG3 fans on my channel, is that you only get one save point in this game, but kind of two. You can load from your last save, which will be a manual save or an auto save. You can also load in from your last in rest. So I'd say use the ends for more concrete saves, but just remember what in you are at and what period of time that you saved it at. Because if you just rely on the, the last save point option, auto saves will many times have overwritten your manual save. I actually don't mind the save system. I kind of like it. It feels quite immersive. It means that you got to really care about what you're doing in the game. But one thing that I don't like in this game is that you can still only have one character on your account. I'm sure there's probably some reason for this, but honestly, I think most players that play this game would like to be able to have multiple characters, especially in a game like this where there is some agency in how you affect the outcome of things. There's real consequences. I might even create another Steam account and buy the game, <laughs> have another copy of the game so I can have another character. It kind of sucks, but it is what it is. Now going back to character creation, I feel like I should just touch on it quickly for those of you that haven't really been in the loop. It is a phenomenal system, one of the best out there, and my characters transferred over from that little uh, free character creator with ease from the pre-release character creator to the full game. It just, it just pretty much just happened. It was super easy. 
And now let's talk about combat. Very impactful feeling. I wouldn't have expected anything else from Capcom and DD2. My FPS surprisingly didn't really dip that much during combat encounters, it was more so being in the towns where that happened. So that was actually a nice surprise. The particle effects and visual effects of the spells and everything in general are pretty cool in this game. And I find myself just staring at my pawns in combat just to watch the scene play out. And on this topic, pawns are actually way smarter than they were in DD1. Huge AI improvements, very noticeable. I had two archer pawns at one point, and let me tell you, it felt like I really had two archer pawns. There were arrows zipping past me, turning opponents into pin cushions. The sounds were great to represent that. It's very, very immersive. And also the pawns are just really good. In fact, they're almost too good, at least in the beginning, as I was trying to learn the game, they were taking all my damn kills. As you can see on the screen right here, we have an ogre just plowing through the forest. It scares the crap out of me. This turned out to be a really epic, fun fight to change up from goblins and wolves, which is like what you really fight at the start of the game. Some really cool creatures in this game to discover. And I would say that the game overall is more difficult than DD1 was. Some mechanics are objectively adding more difficulty, such as reviving your pawns now takes several seconds as opposed to just tapping the button. So you have to kind of have some strategy behind that and not just revive a pawn when there's an ogre that's about to sit on your head. Like I mentioned earlier, there are some tough creatures. My first death in the game was encountering those slime creatures in that cave, and they basically swallowed me up. I didn't even know what to do. I couldn't hurt them with physical damage, couldn't block them. I just got destroyed, but it was actually really fun to then return later on with more knowledge and make easy work out of them. That's a really good feeling of progression. I don't think I need to go into too many details with how combat works, as it's very similar to DD1, but it does feel a little bit different. Stamina consumption occurs, of course, when sprinting and using weapon skills, while core skills, which are more basic skills, don't use stamina at all. So you never really feel like you're powerless because you always have those core skills. You really have to try to not let all of your stamina deplete, otherwise your character will need some recovery time, which leaves you very exposed to other creatures on the battlefield. Climbing in this game is, of course, a huge part of the fun, climbing up creatures and climbing on the back of flying creatures and going across the map and things like that. And the hitboxes, like they were in DD1, are probably some of the best hitboxes that I've ever experienced in an open world action RPG. Where you swing your sword and where an enemy swings at you is where you get hit or hit. For example, if you're knocked down, an opponent may swing too high and then they'll miss you and vice versa. Many times you have to be deliberate with your aim and really look for enemy Weak points. There's lots of great weapon skills in this game, really cool spells as I expected. I love watching my mage pawn use spells, especially Levin. One of my one of my pawns was using the Levin spell, which is like a lightning spell to destroy boxes. It was just so much fun to watch that happen. Also unexpected. The combat in this game is simple when looking at it on the surface, and you are fairly limited in the amount of active skills that you can have available at any given time, which does make it somewhat easy to manage but it's also still fairly nuanced, much more than your basic action RPG. If there's a flying enemy, you have to jump to hit that enemy perfectly, or you have to use a weapon skill that allows you to aim up and things like that. There's a ton of synergies between skills and your pawns and their skills. There's timing, parry mechanics, and much more. I'd say it's fairly easy to get into, but challenging to master. So the combat, as I expected, is a ton of fun, and it's one of the best combat systems, I would say, out there. Now, the vocations in this game also offer a ton of variety. It's really easy to switch vocations, especially in the beginning of the game when you have access to the four starting vocations. You can switch those at any end. They don't require that much to unlock. It's also pretty cool to know that if you want to fully realize your vocation, you have to impress the vocation masters before they allow you to learn the ultimate vocation skill. And things like that add a lot of excitement to combat progression outside of simply just leveling up numbers and vocation ranks. Like the first game, expect to be looking out for better weapons and materials that you acquire in the world from creatures and also mining and gathering certain materials. And all of this can be used to upgrade your weapons and gear and things of that nature. Now, one of the biggest criticisms of DD1 was quality of life features, but DD2 is definitely much better. There was way less clicks needed to do things such as buying and selling and equipping items. The menu navigation is much easier and easier to decipher, might I add. The crafting and combining of items is much easier to navigate and also understand. The lantern is now really easy to pull out, whether you're on controller or mouse and keyboard. Adding oil is a little bit easier. Easier to use consumables like health potions. There's better quest interface design, better map, no more notification board quests. 
and so on. So some great quality of life features. I'm gonna have to play a little bit more to have more of a nuanced take on everything, but definitely notice some improvements. And the last topic I wanna to touch on is the pawns. I didn't expect this video to be this long. It's kind of a really casual rambly video. But uh, here we are. So the pawns in this game are definitely smarter. They offer way cooler voice lines. For example, at one point I was just staring at the environment and looking out into the distance. And one of my pawns said something like, has something yonder caught your eye, master? Which is a nice immersive touch. However, there are plenty of repeat lines and it can get annoying like in the first game, but it's definitely better in this regards. I actually made my main pawn myself and my Arisen is this character that I'm RPing. And it's been so much fun to see my guy running around in front of me, although he sounds nothing like me. And being able to level up my Arisen character and also my main pawn adds a lot more to character progression than games where you only control one character. Now the Rift is where you hire other pawns and you get to hire two other pawns to be part of your group. And it works really just like the first game, albeit it's a bit easier to navigate and understand. I have been loving hiring other players' pawns, although there hasn't really been that many because I'm on the review code, but once this game launches, it's gonna be crazy seeing all the pawns. And also there's some really cool mechanics and systems that have been added to the pawn in general. There's pawn quests now that players can set on their pawns, which give other players rewards if they hire your pawn and then complete that quest. This actually offers the opportunity to trade in some way between players. There's pawn badges, which are awarded to pawns as marks of their accumulated knowledge. As most of you are probably already aware, the pawns that you hire, if they have good knowledge from whatever player they come from, they're going to be able to give you plenty of tips to help you out in the game. I of course, can't leave out the pawn commands where you can send your pawns out to interact with the environment around you. You can have them investigate things. And this is actually pretty fun and it works much better in this game than it did in DD1. You really do feel like you're in command of the party. You can make your pawns wait, which is nice when you don't want them up your ass the entire time. You can put them into help mode, which means that they'll focus more on support. And you can also call them to your side with the to me command. Big improvement for the first game. So much fun to have this adventure group with you that you don't really control, but you do have some control as their leader. The pawn system is a highlight of Dragon's Dogma 2, just like it was for 1. I really hope some other games take some inspiration from it. And that's going to be it for my initial impressions of Dragon's Dogma 2. This really does seem like such a special game and it checks so many boxes for myself. I love the hardcore mechanics. The open world is amazing. It's extremely immersive. Some of the best combat I've ever experienced. Unfortunately, I feel like the game's performance is going to overshadow much of this for many players. Who knows, maybe Capcom will put out a day one patch that makes things much better, but I feel like it's gonna take a little bit longer than that. So this game has my thumbs up. I am so excited to keep playing it and streaming it and making videos for it, but I'm just worried about other people that have worse systems than I do and how it's going to run on those, including consoles too, because it's really just disappointing if you buy a game and it doesn't run well. Thank you all so much for watching. Much more DD2 content to come, including live streams right here on this YouTube channel and my Twitch channel at Wolfheart FPS. I'll catch you on the next one.